You actually may be seated. There is no gospel reading this morning. The sermon is focused on, on that aspect. I'm kind of glad you got up, though. You know, get your blood moving a little bit. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. And I ask, Lord, that you bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart, that your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified among us this day. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there we were. We were on a train from the great city of Paris, France, down to a, a tiny little town about three hours south called Taizé. Now, this little town had a monastery in it, and that monastery is where my family decided that we would spend a week of our sabbatical, uh, learning and growing from the monks there. Well, what were we thinking? <laughs> thinking that we could take our eight-year-old, our five-year-old, and our three-year-old all the way across to the other side of the world to a country where about the only words in the language that we knew, knew are hello, goodbye, and where's the bathroom? <laughs> I thought I could be the translator, you see. I, I had a couple of years of French in college, and I had one of those very handy English to French, uh, you know, uh, spe uh, w phrase books with me. But then, then we got there and, and I had to order lunch for my desperately hungry family. And after not getting at all what I wanted, and then after spending an hour and a half trying to order tickets from uh, Paris to Taizé and being really, really stressed about it, I was having my doubts about my translation abilities. But there we were. On that train car, we were sitting there, my family of five, and the other person in that little compartment area was a French lady. She was sitting there, she had her bag on her lap, and she was kind of holding it with both of her arms. Now here are the assumptions that I made about that woman sitting there. I assumed that she didn't want to be sitting there. I assumed that all the other seats in that particular car were taken up and she sat there because she had to sit there. I mean, somebody had to sit next to the American couple with the three squirmy children. I assumed that we annoyed her. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think my kids are brilliant travelers, but three hours sitting anywhere is too much to ask anyone. So the occasional, the wheels on the train go round and round, round and round, had to be sung out. I'm sure she wished she had her noise-canceling headphones and her little eye patch. I also assumed about her that as soon as another seat opened up in the train, that she would be the first to get up and go find that seat. Until, until she opened up her bag. And she pulled out a loaf of bread and a clump of cheese. Now, here's a little more about her. Where was she from? She told us the name of the town, but it sounded something like Vigivu, or... <laughs> What's so awesome is that Eveline Penzen, <laughs> who is from France, is sitting right here smiling. <laughs> She would give you the proper pronunciation of this town. I quickly forgot it because I tried to pronounce it. It just didn't work. <laughs> but sh this particular town, according to her, was a town where they made the absolute best cheese in France. And let's be honest here, people. It's France, so it was the best cheese in the world. <laughs> she was from this town, but she lived now somewhere else. And so she went home. And when she did go home, she picked up this cheese so that she could take it back with her because they didn't sell this particular cheese where she lived. And then she offered to give us some of the cheese. Was she crazy? She went all the way home to get this cheese so that she could bring it back, and now she's offering it to us. A people whose full extent of the knowledge of cheese goes to a Subway restaurant. 
where we're looking down trying to decide whether we want the orange or the white. <laughs> Maybe she was crazy. But I think the reason that she offered us that cheese that day is because she loved it so much. And she was proud of where she grew up. You know how that is? Where sometimes you love something so much you want to tell everybody about it. Here's what I do know. That that little act of hospitality that she extended to us on that day transformed that little train compartment. No longer were we feeling like strangers who were making a mental note to never visit France again. We were now friends. No longer could we assume about this woman that we annoyed her, that, that she, she didn't want to be around us. Rather, she was spending her time trying to figure out how she could make us feel welcome in her home. We spent the rest of the train ride hearing in English with a very lovely French accent about what makes good cheese about her home, and about some inside knowledge of, 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 of what we should do while we were in France. You know what it felt like? It felt like Holy Communion, or at least the way communion should feel. And, and this, this is the very reason why hospitality was such an incredibly important ministry in the early church. And it's why it should still be an incredibly important ministry, especially for us today living in this I'm way too busy to do that kind of stuff culture that we're living in. It is why when Jesus told his disciples to gather together, his followers to gather together, he commanded them to eat bread together. It is why Jesus called himself the bread of life. The reason is because bread changes things. It has the power to make enemies friends. Bread changes things. Now last week, if you were here, you know that we were talking about the first part of Acts chapter 2. The great spectacular sensory miracle of Pentecost with the sound of the mighty rushing wind and the smoke and the fire and the tongues of fire appearing over the, 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 the apostles' heads and, and the speaking in tongues. And if you remember, it was a well-timed miracle because it happened in Jerusalem at a, at a pilgrimage festival. And so people who had come now for thousands of miles all across the Roman Empire were there in Jerusalem going up to worship at the temple and, and on their way they saw this great miracle happen and, and it was too much for them. They couldn't fit their minds around it. They couldn't figure it out. They were trying to make sense of it. And so they asked this great mind, head kind of question, what does this mean? 